Hello, and welcome to Wireless Lighting Control with the Arduino and Vixen, Part 1. I'm Akiba from Freak Labs, and I'm here to guide you through this tutorial. In this tutorial, we'll be using Vixen 3, which can be downloaded from vixenlights.com. Before we get into the wireless aspect, we need to set up a simple wired system to understand how things work. We're going to start by setting up six LEDs. These will correspond to individual channels on Vixen that we'll be controlling. We'll also be using the fretboard, which is an Arduino compatible board I designed with an integrated breadboard. You can also just use an Arduino and an external breadboard. Right now, I'm inserting current limiting resistors into pins 2 through 7 on the board. These will limit the current through the LEDs to about 20 milliamps. Now I'm inserting the LEDs. I'm using pink LEDs here since they have good contrast with room lighting. Each of these LEDs will be digitally controlled via pins 2 through 7. We will just be turning these LEDs on and off, although we can also extend the system for full PWM dimming control as well. There should be plenty of tutorials on the net about how to dim LEDs using hardware or software PWM. So I'm mainly focused on interfacing to the sequencing software and understanding the communications protocol in each link. When you're inserting the LEDs, be careful to keep track of which side the current flows. In layman's terms, the long leg of the LED is the high side and the short leg of the LED will be connected to ground. I have about 20 years of experience in engineering and I still often make this mistake. This is what the final circuit looks like. It's not beautiful, but it's functional, and that's all we really need. If we're able to blink an LED, we can turn on or off just about anything, including power LEDs, stage lights, motors, or just about anything that's electrically powered. The next step is getting familiar with the Vixen software. This is the Vixen software. I'm currently using version 3.2, which is much more stable than the older version 2 from my previous tutorial a few years back. It takes a bit of getting used to since there are some abstract concepts, so I'll be leading you through the setup. We're going to start off by setting up the display. We need to configure the lighting elements we'll be using. In our case, since we're just using 6 LEDs, I'm going to configure 6 single item elements. Single item elements are dimmable lights or devices that can have a value from 0 to 255. You can also set the dimming curve and the display color. I'm doing a group select here and setting the parameters for our LEDs all at once. In our case, our LEDs just have a single color, so we'll select that. We won't set up the dimming curve, although it's possible to change it. This comes in handy when you have devices that don't dim linearly, which are most of them. I'm also going to select the display color for the user interface that approximates the color of the LEDs. This just makes things a bit easier and intuitive, but it's not really needed. I'm now setting up the sequencer output. I'll be using the generic serial output to send data out the serial port. I'm configuring it for six outputs, where each output is used for a single channel. I also need to configure the serial port with the correct parameters. In this case, I'm using 57,600 BPS, 8 bits, no parity, and 1 stop bit. These are all very standard settings and are almost default. I'm also configuring the sequencer output to send a header before sending all the channel data. I can use this to mark the starter frame. This way, if I ever lose track of where I am in a frame, the worst I can do is drop one frame and then I'll be aligned again. Finally, we need to patch our LEDs to our outputs. This sets a relationship between the lighting element and the output channel. In this case, we have the simplest relationship, which is one to one. You can see this better using the graphical view. Now that we've finished our setup, it's time to start a new sequence. Once we click the New Sequence button, a new sequencer window will pop up, and using the information we just configured, you should see the lighting elements in the window. Now we're going to add in the audio and test out the music on the timeline. This next step isn't required, but it makes things much easier. I'm going to use the built-in beat detection algorithm to generate markers for me on the timeline. It makes the tedious task of sequencing the lighting much more automated. After that, I'm going to configure the effects to snap to the markers with a high snap strength. Markers are a great way to precisely control lighting events since you can have them automatically generated and then tweak them as needed. The lighting effects will snap to the markers so you can align events easily. I'm now adding the lighting effects to the sequence. I'm using the set level effect, which allows us to set an arbitrary level to the lighting element, in this case, the LEDs. We can send any level from 0 to 255, but since I have the LEDs connected to digital outputs, we'll just use full on and full off. The lighting effects will snap to the markers, and then I just generate a pattern that I want. Once I have that pattern, I'll copy and paste it to the rest of the sequence.
Now that we have the sequence set up, the first thing I'd like to do is see what the output looks like coming out of the sequencer. To do this, I'm going to sniff the serial port. I'll be using a special Freakduino board with an ATmega 1284p MCU on it. It has two serial ports, so I can use one serial port to collect data from the sequencer and one serial port to echo the data to a terminal screen. Once we can see what the data looks like, it'll be much easier to write software to decode the data. This step isn't required, and it's also possible to use a standard Arduino board and the software serial library to emulate another serial port. It's time to start writing some Arduino code. This is a simple sketch that takes data from the main serial port and echoes it to the second serial port. First, we're going to initialize our variables and both serial ports in the setup function. We then go into the loop function and implement the meat of the code. I'm checking to see if data is available in the serial port. If it is, then I'll read out a byte and store it inside my channel value array. When I have more than 8 bytes, that's the max channels plus 2 bytes for the header. Then I'm going to dump all the data in the array to the second serial port. Now I'm going to connect my terminal emulator to the second serial port and then go back into Vixen to enable the sequencer output. You can see the raw data coming out of the sequencer, which is a 2 byte header followed by 6 bytes of data each byte corresponding to one channel. All channel bytes are zero since no events are triggering. To trigger events, we need to go to the timeline and start playing the sequence. You can then see the data toggling as each event is hit. From the data, we can see that we need to decode the first two byte header for frame alignment, and the next six bytes will be the values for each channel. Once we understand the format, we can start writing the software to decode it and send the data to our lights. Now we can start working on the actual code. I'm starting a new Arduino sketch. In this sketch, I'm defining the number of channels, max channels, creating two variables, the channel variable and state variable, and creating my channel value array. I'm also storing the digital pin numbers I'll be using in the pins array. There's many ways to write this code, but I'll be implementing it using a state machine. State machines are useful for decoding sequential operations, especially communications packets that include headers and footers. In this state machine, there will be four enumerated states, which just means that the states will have sequential numerical values, like 0, 1, 2, etc. I'm doing this because the state names will have much more meaning than the numbers. Now it's time to write the setup and loop functions. In the setup function, I need to initialize the output pins I'll be using. I'm looping through each pin in the pins array and using the pin mode function to set it as an output. Then I'm initializing the pin value to low so that it won't light the LED. I then initialize the state and channel variables and finally the serial port using the serial.begin function. The loop function is where the meat of the code takes place. We're going to write a state machine which is basically a large flowchart in software. When certain events happen it triggers us to move to the next sequential state until we come back full circle to the starting state. The first thing to do is check if data was received from the serial port. If data was received, then how we handle it depends on what state we're in. So this is where we start writing the state machine decoder. State machines can be written using if else statements, but I prefer using the switch statement because I think it ends up cleaner. It's just a matter of coding style though. We're going to check the state variable and depending on the state, the code will jump to different branches of execution. I like to list out all the states first and then fill them in as I go. The idle state is the first state. This is where we always start from. When we're in this state, we wait for the first delimiter, which is a plus sign. This signals to us that the frame is about to start. Once we see the plus sign, we go to the next state. In the delim state, we check to see if we get the next part of the header, which is a greater than sign. If we do, then that means the frame has started and we will transition to the next state, which is to read the data stream from the serial port. If it's not what we expect, then we must be lost in the data stream somewhere, so we go back to idle and wait for the header to be resent. In the worst case, we'll lose two frames of data before resynchronization, which is about a 20 millisecond glitch, so the penalty isn't too bad. In the read state, the actual frame has just started, so we take the data from the serial port and store it into our channel value array. Once we have more than max channels of data, or 6 bytes of data in this example case, then we reset our channel counter and go to the display state. The display state is where we decode the data and translate that into flashing LEDs. We take the array of channel values and loop through them. If the value is non-zero, then we turn the LED on. If the value is zero, then we turn it off. 
If we implemented dimming, like say using a software PWM library, then we could map the value from the sequencer to a dimming value for the LED. But to keep things simple, we're just going to turn it on and off. At this point, we download the code into the fretboard or Arduino, open up our Vixen lighting sequence, and start it. We can now decode the serial data from the sequencer and translate it into lighting triggers to drive our LEDs. This is just a simple example of controlling lighting with Vixen and an Arduino. But if you understand these concepts, then you can expand on them to do amazing things. Here are a few examples. Also, if you're interested in the hardware seen in this video, come check out my web shop at www.freaklabstore.com. In part two of this series, I'll demonstrate how to do lighting control wirelessly using Vixen and Arduinos.